And uh, so if you are on camera, that will be, that does have the potential of being recorded as well. So just please plan accordingly. Um, this video will be uh, posted to our website and available via YouTube as well. Um, so if you are interested in sharing this with, with other folks, I do hope that you will, um, will encourage uh, their, um, their participation and, and view it uh, later as well. So with that, I am uh, happy to turn this over to Harry Glasgow, our MC, and I will be admitting folks from the lobby and we appreciate that you, your patience as you've been waiting in the lobby. Um, and with that, Harry, if you would like to do the introduction, you are yes, welcome. Yes, ma'am, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I have to make sure that I'm being heard. Um, you are. I am, okay, very good. Uh, I have spent a lot of time on Saturday mornings introducing speakers to the Soil and Water Conservation District Green Breakfast, and I've always enjoyed it, but I've never been able to do it spontaneously. This is probably my very first time because I've known Jim McGlone a long time. And uh, I know his connection to Chicago as well as mine. I know his, uh, uh, his family. I know uh, his beautiful property. Um, and, uh, and, and I know him. So Jim McGlone is um, a feature personality in Fairfax County that uh, uh, just about everybody knows, I think. Uh, and he does a terrific job of informing us about forests, about individual trees, about pests that gather in the forest and, and uh, whatnot. I have learned as much from Jim McGlone about trees and whatnot as I have ever learned anywhere else. Um, and it is, it is a, a, it's a great pleasure to know him and to take this opportunity to introduce him to all of you who may not know Jim McLean, although I find that hard to understand. Um, Jim uh, is a, a scholar. He uh, holds a doctorate in something. I, I've forgotten which. Economics, Economics that's right. And uh, uh, is... Uh, a very good friend of mine. So, I, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without going on any further and wrecking any kind of introduction, I, let me introduce you to Jim McGlone, who is the uh, urban conservation. I'm getting coaches from the back, from the side here. <laughs> urban, urban coaching, or urban. Forest. Urban forest conservationist, Harry. That's it. Urban <laughs> forest conservationist. I'll write that down. And uh, uh, is, a, is a gifted speaker. You're going to you're going to hear that, and he's going to tell us an awful lot <clears throat> about trees. Jim. Thank you, Harry. Um, wow, there's all sorts of people who showed up. All right. Can everybody see my? Uh, yeah, there's my cursor. Let's get started here. So thank you for that welcome, Harry. Uh, as Harry said, my name is Jim McGlone. I'm an urban forest conservationist with the Virginia Department of Forestry. And we're gonna be talking this morning a little bit about urban forests and some of their initiatives. Just need to move that box. So, you know, I can't see my notes. Um, And so to begin with, let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits from urban forests. I'm sure most of you are aware of these. I call these forest environmental benefits. These are the things that trees do uh, as part of the life cycle and just being trees. And they happen to be things we enjoy like better air quality, managed stormwater, storing carbon, improving soils uh, and recycling oxygen. And the thing is that trees will do this whether we're around to benefit from them or appreciate it or not. There are, however, um, some things that are that happen in the urban forest um, 
that we don't necessarily get these benefits unless there are people around to interact with the trees, like lowering energy costs and higher property value. Um, one of the things I always like to point out to people is it takes a lot less effort to take care of a tree than it does to take care of a lawn. It also takes a lot less inputs. Lawns are very um, resource um, heavy um, landscapes. And if you do your uh, landscape properly, trees can be part of, its, of supporting an integrated pest management program. Um, Harry mentioned my house. We've been doing conservation landscaping for 16 years, and we never have pest problems. But the biggest benefit, or one of the benefits that's really been stressed over the last, uh, especially the last 20 years or so, a lot literature on the benefits of the urban forest are coming, it's coming out of the public health and literature rather than from um, the more tree hugging type of things like the Journal of Arboriculture. However, all of these benefits do come with a potential cost and certainly risk. I'm sure you've all seen pictures or heard stories like this. Uh, the urban forest can be a dangerous place. Now, one of the things uh, about the uh, story or a uh, situation like this is the reporters will show up and they'll talk all about the tree that fell on the house and they'll talk to the uh, homeowner and they'll talk to the neighbors and they'll talk to the emergency service person. They never talk to an arborist about it. Because if you asked an arborist to interpretation of this, the first thing they point out is all of these trees in the background that are all the same species as the tree that fell that went through the storm perfectly unharmed. The next thing they might point out is the break at the top of the tree. Those are old breaks. That means this tree has been in decline for a long time and the top has actually died and fallen out of the tree, which is a sign that you have bad roots which is why this tree fell. The root system was completely rotten. Uh, and what that comes down to and what that means is that to get those benefits that we want from our urban trees, we need to take care of our trees and taking care of, their tr of our trees is just like taking care of yourself or your pets or any other living thing. They need to see the doctor periodically. And in the case of trees, a doctor would be a certified arborist. One of the things I want to be sure you all understand is that in the state of Virginia, there is no state-sponsored certification program. Anybody who wants to can sell tree services. All you need is a pickup truck and a chainsaw. You don't have to demonstrate any knowledge about tree biology and physiology. So when I say getting an arborist to look at your trees. I mean, somebody who's been certified by a third party is actually knowing something about trees like the International Society of Arboriculture or the Tree Care Industry of America. But there's still some things that you as an individual can do. You should be aware of some of the pests and diseases out there. Um, now, when we talk about pests and diseases or pathogens, there are two types that we look at. There's a primary pathogen or a primary pest, and these can attack and kill healthy, mature trees. Usually, these primary uh, pests and diseases are non-native. So, an example of a primary pathogen is a chestnut blight. This can attack and kill a mature, healthy chestnut tree, at least from the, the, um, the stump up. Then we have secondary pests and diseases, and these usually are only attacking stressed or immature trees. Some of them may attack mature, healthy trees, but they're usually not going to kill them. And almost all of our native pests and diseases fit in this category because of coevolution. If they were highly lethal to healthy, mature trees that would have killed off the, that species of trees. And an example of that is the uh, oak horn gall wasp, uh, which I use simply because I've got a really cool picture of it. Uh, these things get in and they 
lay their eggs in the twigs of oak trees. And as the, uh, the eggs hatch and the larvae mature, they force the tree to grow these unusual, to have these unusual growths. And they feed off the photosynthate in the tree. So that's a little bit of a weakening to, of the tree, but it doesn't kill the tree. You can still see you've got good on both sides of this gall. Um, these galls, by the way, were very important in the history of our country. If you ever heard of Iron Gall Inc., which is what uh, the founding fathers used to write the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution, uh, it was this is what the gall refers to. They use these oak galls because, among other things, they these uh, changes is we get tannin um, that was uh, that gets concentrated in these galls, and they actually were harvested specifically for the tannin in them. So we do have some primary, established primary pathogens and, uh, in the area. I'm sure you're all aware of our friend, the emerald ash borer. Uh, this thing attacks and kills mature, healthy uh, ash trees. Uh, the length of time it takes to do that depends on how long or how many are going after the tree at one time. Another primary pathogen that's well established is Dutch elm disease. It's a vascular wilt disease and that will cause uh, dieback, uneven um, and patchy dieback in the front of the tree because it starts up in the top of the tree, works its way down, and then it'll work into all these other branches. This is uh, Hemlock woolia delgid. It is endemic here in Fairfax County. It is not a huge pest because we don't have that many hemlock trees, but if you do have a hemlock tree, it is well worth the effort to go out and look underneath the, the branches. You'll see these little puffy, uh, like cottony things. These are the adelgids uh, in this, the leaf axles. And this is what chestnut blight, chestnut blight canker. And again, it only affects chestnut. Um, another big pest that we have in this area, and this is a native pest, is called gloomy scale. It particularly likes um, maple trees. So if you see maple uh, gloomy or blackish color, that's a combination of these scale insects and uh, something called sooty mold that is associated with scale and adelgid and anything else that Tree. Usually a secondary, secondary pathogen. A sterile environment like this parking lot island, it can they can kill the tree because they don't have the tree is left without any um, natural defenses from um, the things that eat these scales. We do have a new scale insect. Uh, we don't know yet whether it's going to be a primary or a secondary pest. It's related to gloomy scale. It's great for a bark scale. Um, this is something that first popped up, I think, in Texas or Mississippi uh, and has been a problem down in the Tidewater area for a while. And these pictures I took this summer in the city of Alexandria. So you can see if you're familiar with crepe myrtle, it's supposed to have kind of a brown uh, bark or trunk. And you can see now it's got this white velvety texture, which is all of these little scale insects. And you can see different, um, different generations of them. These are the smaller crawlers and these are the adults. Uh, these are like, um, these are related to aphids and again, these are phloem feeders, so they've got proboscis, they stick through the bark, and they're sucking photosynthesis out of the, um, the phloem of the tree. The new frankenbug on the horizon you probably have heard about is spotted lanternfly. There was actually a big article about it in the Smithsonian a couple of months ago. Um, the Master Naturalist had a presentation on it. There is a uh, presentation online at the Urban Forest Management Division, the County Urban Forest Management Division, where we did a uh, webinar, I think it was back in August, uh, about out of lanternfly. This is what it looks like. It is not a fly. 
It does not have a lantern, but it is spotted. It's a leaf hopper. These things are about one inch long and they're basically giant aphids. We're not sure whether or not this is gonna be a primary pest in the forest setting, but it is creating havoc in the agricultural sector, particularly in the uh, grape, apple and stone fruit industries. Um, we're not sure what, how far, what the range of hosts for this thing is. The list now is, I think, at 70 and it keeps growing. I've seen pictures of these things on corn. So they will get on pretty much anything that produces uh, sugar. This is a clip of the distribution map, pretty much half of Pennsylvania, the Western part of uh, New Jersey, even into New York and Ohio now. But this shows here Here we are in Fairfax, it's established in Clark and Warren, um, Warren counties and Winchester. It's also in uh, some counties in Western Maryland and West Virginia. The purple dots are places where we have found confirmed uh, adults without, show, without uh, finding a breeding population. So it's moving into us. And these things are tremendous hitchhikers. They will get on anything they can. What, we, what I would ask you to do is here are a couple of websites. All you need to do is uh, search on Spotted Lanternfly Virginia. This is uh, the VDAX website. They are in charge of the response to lanternfly. You can also go on extension. If you find something you think is a spotted lanternfly, take some pictures if you can capture it and the extension offices ever open, you can actually take it in to get it identified. But take some pictures of it. Both of these websites have places where you can submit those pictures uh, and you can also submit to the County Urban Forest Management Division at pestmail at fairfaxcounty.gov. Um, they are also interested in reporting, asking or having you report on Tree of Heaven because that's an integral part of this bug's life history. Anyway, once you take the picture and you report it, we ask that you kill it uh, with extreme prejudice. One of the big issues we're going to have with this is it's not hard to kill, but the growers are now using five times insecticide because there's so damn many of them uh, to kill. A little bit further afield. Um, so remember, spotted lanternfly goes after grapes and hops. I'm sure that will paint uh, Harry, who's a big beer aficionado. And um, this one, Laurel Wilt, goes after avocado. So these are the party poopers of the bugs out there. We don't have Laurel Wilt in Virginia yet, but it will attack and very quickly kill. Uh, trees and plants in the laurel family, which would include sassafras and spice bush locally, but for um, gourmands out there, uh, sassafras is the source of the filet spice in Cajun food, and bay leaf is also in the laurel family, and avocado is the Florida groves are already being devastated by this. And another one that we're always concerned about is Asian longhorn beetle. Um, currently, it is established in Massachusetts, New York, Ohio, and South Carolina. The good news is uh, it did get into Chicago and they were successful in eradicating it. One of the big issues with this, uh, with regard to the urban forest, is its favorite food is maple, which makes up 20 to 5 percent of our urban forests. So we're really concerned about the area where there are so many maples, although it will feed on almost any hardwood tree. It has been found in Virginia, but again, in a non-reproductive sense. So it was in a single individual or a couple of males or females that were uh, not able to establish populations here in Virginia. Now, the big question I'm sure you're all asking is what's killing my oaks? 
Uh, I've heard lots of different things, and I will tell you that as far as the Virginia Department of Forestry can figure out, it's something called oak decline syndrome. This is a spiral. We start with a healthy tree, which is in a marginal position. Something hits it, whether it's uh, a, a defoliation or a weather event, um, and the tree gets uh, stressed and then other things hit it and it slowly spirals in and finally dies. This is a process that can take um, 10, it can take up to 10 years, sometimes even longer, but essentially what it comes down to is it's repeated stress. It's sort of like if you get a cold and you try to power through it and then you wind up with the flu and you try and power through that and you wind up with pneumonia and you try and power through that, then you wind up here as a dead tree. The difference, of course, is that you can go to bed and take aspirin and drink plenty of fluids and get better. Trees don't really have that opportunity. The weather that we've had for the past, um, well, since the beginning of 2018 has been really hard on trees. We went 18 months with above average rainfall. Then we got hit with three months of below average rainfall during really bad heat last summer. And I don't, you're probably aware of this, but for the past seven months, we have been again above average monthly rainfall. So uh, the saturated soils are not good for especially the chestnut and white oak. So these are some of the uh, things that uh, predisposing factors, uh, inciting factors, and then contributing factors that can eventually lead to the death of your oak tree or your other trees as well. Because this is not restricted to oaks. I saw maples and uh, hickories last summer under the same conditions. We do know some things that are not killing your oak tree. Oak wilt is caused by a specific fungus. Uh, people have talked about this. It's never, uh, we did a lot of sampling, in, especially in the summer of 2019. As far as we know, it is not present in Virginia. It's mainly found in the Midwest and the Plains states. Then there's sudden oak death, which is caused by the Uomycite uh, Phytophthora remorum. Phytophthora is Greek for plant destroyer destroyer and there are a lot of phytophthoras this particular one is very fatal to oaks and although it's called sudden oak death it usually takes about five or six years for this to kill a mature tree we find it on the west coast in northern california and oregon it's not in virginia it has been imported because phytophthora remorum will attack more than oaks in particular it'll get after rhododendrons and we have had some rhododendrons that have been imported into the East Coast, but fortunately it does enough damage to the rhododendrons that the wholesalers recognized it, contacted their local uh, agricultural office. It was identified and the plants were destroyed before they got sold and distributed. The other thing that's not killing your oak trees, and I hear this from some arborists and people, is ambrosia beetles. Ambrosia beetles are a secondary pathogen. They are a really bad sign because they only attack really stressed trees. So if you have ambrosia beetles in your oak tree, that's a sign that it is mostly dead, but it's not the ambrosia beetles that are doing it. It's moved in because that tree, <coughs> excuse me, has been, um, has been weakened by other things. So, uh, with that said, I want to do some program updates. Now, I'm going to re remind you of these benefits that we get from our uh, urban forest. And one of the things I want to tell you about is the Tree Action Plan 2019. Um, this is a county plan uh, for dealing with uh, dealing with um, the urban forest over the next couple of decades. And I put this picture up uh, because this gives you an idea of the difficulty in managing the urban forest. This is part of the public safety building. 
The fire department wants all our roads to be wide enough for two cars to park on either side and still deploy their fucking ladder trucks. You can debate whether or not we need that level of public safety, but regardless, it does affect the space for trees. Um, VDOT runs the roads. These trees are, are owned by uh, Fairfax County and managed by the facilities management division. You've got corporate ownership back here. All of these trees in the background between Fairfax Corners and um, Tyson's are over the town of Vienna. So you've got parks, you've got uh, schools, you've got town parks, you've got county parks. Um, and of course, a lot of private citizens who own trees out there. So there are a lot of people who affect the urban forest, not just people like me with the Virginia Department of Forestry or people in the um, Urban Forest Management Division. And that was one of the central features of the Tree Action Plan. It's what we call the community of practice. A big part of what we're going to be doing is outreach and education to make people understand that they are part of the, they are ma helping manage at least some small part of the urban forest. Uh, as I said, it's a strategic plan. We started to create the community of practice, unfortunately, March 12, 2020. I know some of you were at the charrette at Pebbles Mill to talk about tree planting. And of course, a day or two later, the governor shut down the uh, state and we all went into hiding from the coronavirus. But we are planning to, um, to revive that effort one of the good things to come out of coronavirus is we've all gotten familiar at doing stuff like we're doing this morning, and that is having big meetings on uh, the internet. If you are interested in planting trees, there is some help for you. Uh, the Department of Forestry has its Virginia Trees for Clean Water grants. The Soil and Water District has the VCAP program, which is funded by the state for private lands and the CAP program for common interest land, that would be HOA property or churches or things like that, which are funded by the county. If you happen to live in McLean, there's a McLean Trees Foundation that can help you put trees in your uh, yard. Fairfax Relief provides seedlings and will plant them for you. And there is a tree planting and preservation fund, which is funded by the um, developers actually who for whatever reason cannot simply cannot meet their tree planting and preservation requirements on the site this is paying that is uh, a last ditch effort it is after all other options are exploit or have been um, explored that they're allowed to do that and and perhaps Laura say something more about this I don't know I haven't heard a recent update, but in, I think it was the 2018 or 2019 General Assembly, there was a bill passed that allows localities to establish a local stormwater management fund with tax dollars that can help um, private landowners deal with stormwater issues, which might include planting trees. Uh, I know the county is talking about this, but this has not been enacted, that's why I have the question mark around it. If you're looking for native trees or shrubs, um, on February 2nd, there is going to the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District seedling sale is going to open. I encourage you to think about the, like getting Jimmy Buffett tickets. I think they sold out in two or three days last year. So you do not want to procrastinate. The information on the seedlings is already on their website. So be ready at eight o'clock on the morning of February 2nd or possibly at midnight um, to place your order because these things are going to go fast. You can also get uh, buy trees directly from the Virginia Department of Forestry, buytrees.com. Plant Nova Natives does not actually sell trees, but they have a lot of information on where you can buy trees in terms of um, native plant retailers, as well as native plant sales from groups like the uh, 
Virginia Native Plant Society. And Fairfax Relief also gives trees to individuals along with tree, tree protectors. So they're not only giving, not only out planting trees, they're also providing trees for other people to plant. Another big initiative is the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Improvement Plan Phase 3, better known as WIP 3. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff in here that it's, I think, 150 pages. But a big initiative under WIP 3 is to plant a lot of trees. This is for the Potomac work area, which is Fairfax, Prince William, Loudoun, and Arlington County. That's where I work work and this is broken down this is only 10 percent of the overall whip three goal and this urban uh planting is the number of trees i should have included shrubs there this is we are going to be trying to count every tree and every shrub that is planted in northern virginia so if you plant a tree in your yard it and report it it counts and that means i only have to find 56,214 trees is 250. Also, if you are doing a planting along the stream, we're looking for uh, 128 acres of urban buffers. Last year, I reported 0.7 acres. So we need to up our game there and we need to make sure it gets reported. And I'll talk about how you can do that in a minute things in the governor's proposed budget that would affect Northern Virginia. Um, we are looking because the Department of Forestry is taking the lead on all of these tree planting efforts. They are proposing four new um, positions to help support WIP, the WIP3 planting initiatives, uh, watershed program managers, and then we have three regions um, so these would be brand new positions that are being established. They're also, he's also proposed $500,000 for the Water Quality Improvement Fund for urban tree planting. So that is, would support uh, the Virginia Trees for Clean Water Grant. I know uh, the money come, some of the money comes out of that. I think that some of this money would also go to the VCAP program, but I'm not sure about that. And we are going to, um, the uh, nursery, the Augusta nursery, um, is going to be expanded. At least the proposal is to provide funds to buy more land so they will be able to grow more trees to meet these goals. One of the things I want you to be understand about the uh, Department of Forestry nurseries is they receive no tax funding. They are completely self-supported by selling trees. Mainly, that's about 25 million Loblolly pine seedlings that they sell every year, but all the other trees help as well. And that's why they select the trees for their uh, to sell that they do. Now, how can you report your trees? Well, there is this uh, app that the Department of Forestry is still working on. Um, it's out there, it's live. I have not been trained on what happens after you enter your data, but you can enter your data now. It's a fairly simple thing to, to use. Um, if you follow this web or this link, it'll bring you to our tree stories. You just click on the add your tree tab. It'll bring up this map and there's an orange box over the top of the map. If you click on the X in the orange box, it'll go away. And then you can just put in an address and fill out a form. Now, Laura told me there were some uh, there was some confusion or questions about who's supposed to do this. If you are planting a tree in your yard, you're supposed to do it. If you are planting as part of a group, then the group leader either should be doing it or should be assigning somebody to do it. So this would be part of planning your tree planting. Uh, project is figuring out who is actually going to enter the data. <clears throat> so uh, one last thing before I sign off, if I don't know if you've been observing, but you may have seen this little uh, firefly icon in the upper left. 
And that has to do with my next three slides. Uh, the next two slides I got from Doug Ptolemy, and he has been doing presentations. Many of you probably know he wrote a book called Bringing Nature Home. And in it, he has been talking about the value of native plants for all of us. And in some of his presentations, he talks about, he uses this slide, which is if we replant half the area now, now in lawn, we can create a 20 million acre home national park. To put that in perspective, 20 million acres is the combined is more than the combined uh, acreage in all of these uh, state and national parks. Some of these are like Denali, uh, Canyonlands, Yellowstone, and Adir Adirondacks are really, really big parks but we're growing more turf than all of these parks combined. So a web marketing type person happened to hear his presentation and she and Doug got together and they created the Homegrown National Park. This is a pretty new thing. Again, go in and map your land, your natural landscape it's not that hard to do i've already done it and eventually the map will go live and it'll show people where all of these uh parts of the homegrown national park are and for alan they are going to have a sign template it's not out there yet but it's coming so that would be something that you can put in your yard to show that you are part of the homegrown national park and that Concludes my prepared remarks. I've been watching, I've been seeing questions come up. Uh, and so I'm done yammering about what I wanted to talk about. So I will listen to whatever anybody else wants to talk about. If you, uh, Laura and Harry, should I just go ahead and uh, stop sharing so we can get to the questions or? Well, I think you can you can hold on to your um why don't you keep your contact information up there for just a little bit, Jim, so folks can uh capture it uh while we're while we're having a conversation. Um I don't even know if I introduced myself earlier. I'm Laura Grape, the executive director with the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District. So I've been the one tippy tapping there in the chat trying to keep up with um some of the questions and provide some additional information. And again, we're really, Jim, thank you for a great overview of a wide variety of different topics. Um, I think that one of the things that I have found through um, my experience working at the district and certainly working with other um, professionals in the field, a lot of times we just are trying to figure out what's going on that's creating this, this issue, whether it's a drainage issue or whether it's something happening with the trees. And so, Jim, your your expertise in in really breaking it down and figuring out what the problem is helps to pre be able to create better solutions and um, helps others to make better informed decisions. So I just really want to thank you. And um, we have 97 participants today who are all having the experience of, of getting to see you in, in action and, and recognize the, the great asset that you are um, to Fairfax County as well. So thank you very much. I wanted to just mention, and, and I just appreciate the, the participation in the chat. There's a lot of folks adding links to a wide variety of different announcements and activities. So please take a, take a look at that. We do have a door prize today. So please um, take a look at the link that's up at the top. You'll actually need to click the second link because I typed the first one in incorrectly. I apologize. Um, for one of two uh, Sierra Club, um, um, uh, wall calendars, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But Jim, we did have a slew of questions that came in, and there may be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, several others uh, that have come in just while I've been bantering on here. My coffee has kicked in, as you may have tell can tell. Um, but let let's begin up at the top, since we do have quite a quite some time for some questions. Carolyn asked, um, what opportunities are you aware of for young aspiring urban foresters that are really interested in the planning, planning without the T, planning side of urban forestry? 
can you give a, a few insights into where um, folks can, if they're interested in pursuing a career in urban forestry, where they can, what job postings and listings and things like that, that might be available for urban foresters? Um, unfortunately, uh, and I sat, I was a uh, part of a, a steering committee, the uh, steering committee for a project that was done um, that looked at just that question. And unfortunately, uh, the the title urban forestry is not well defined. Um, there are some programs now where you can study urban forestry and it's certainly worthwhile. But as I showed in that slide, the urban forest encompasses a whole lot of stuff. So it involves planners, it's now involving healthcare workers, it's involving uh, people who are arborists or know about trees. Um, they have to know a lot, be kind of a jack of all trades to be a good urban forester because uh, if you think about uh, the urban or a forest, it's trees growing uh, within the constraints of the area around them. You go out into the uh, a rural forest, then it's about the soils and the topography and um, the rainfall and climate. Well, those all th those things all affect the urban forest, but you, then you also have to bring in uh, the sidewalks, the roads, the utilities, the houses, soccer moms, uh, all of these different things that are creating uh, different um, demands on that limited space that you have in an urban setting. So there are lots of different avenues you can go down to become an urban forester. If you're really interested, you know, if this is a young person who's really interested in trees uh, and, and uh, forests, there are some very good programs now that, uh, forestry programs now that are offering an urban forest um, uh, track. And of course, the, the closest one is Virginia Tech. They have a very good urban forestry program there, but when you go there, be you know, you want to take some courses in plant, urban planning and other things because that's all part of being an urban forester. There is no, you know, it's it's not like I was trained as an economist, which Harry couldn't remember, uh, and they have a convention every year between Christmas and New Year's, and you can go, it's a, it's a job there. There's no equivalent thing for urban forestry. Um, so you just have to uh, kind of get in there and start looking for for jobs uh, in the, the field. It certainly wouldn't hurt to get to know some of your local urban foresters, uh, like Brian Keatley, who is the director of the Urban Forest Management Division, or uh, Vincent Verway, who is uh, his counterpart in Arlington. Great. Some, some good advice. Certainly, it's still an emerging emerging field. Um, and, and one, again, that I am really grateful that Fairfax County uh, has, has made quite a bit of investment in, and, and there continues to be um, some great work in terms of, um, of strong planning. Um, Jim, we got a, a handful of questions that relate to some of the, the uh, urban forest pests, some that you mentioned, and then some that um, um, I I another that is uh, uh, can be considered a pest, perhaps. But let's start with uh, Brian's question, which is related to uh, crepe myrtle bark scale. And do you know if crepe myrtle bark scale affects any other plants? At this point, um, it's only been detected on crepe myrtle, that particular scale insect, but Keep in mind, there are uh, several genre of uh, scale insects. Um, so pretty much for every plant, there's a scale. It's just not crepe myrtle bark scale. <clears throat> gotcha. Um, another question came up regarding um, emerald ash borers. And do you think that it is a good idea to preemptively spray for uh, emerald ash borers? Um, for if you have a large ash tree that you want to preserve, I think uh, treating it with um, amoectin benzoate, uh, which is a particular chemical that is particularly good at dispersing into the phloem of the tree, uh, is 
is a good idea. The department had a um, a program to actually uh, cost share those treatments. I am not sure if we've got any money for it this year, but certainly if you want to protect uh, an existing ash tree and you don't spray this stuff, it's injected directly into the trunk of the tree, so you need to hire an arborist. Treatments usually run about $15 uh, per inch diameter, and they're good for two years. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, Kathy asked if you have any concerns about planting trees or bushes or shrubs this spring when cicadas are expected this summer. Do you have any recommendations for netting to protect from cicadas? <laughs> um, it really depends on how big you're going to be planting, how big a uh, specimen you're going to be planting. If you're dealing, say, for example, with the uh, trees and shrubs from the seedling sale, they're going to be pretty protected from the cicadas because they're small. The cicadas usually want to get higher up into the tree to lay their eggs, uh, simply to protect them more from, from predators. So I would probably not want to, and, and actually I would recommend against planting anything over one inch diameter, uh, whether there are cicadas coming or not. We've got a lot of research that shows that the smaller the when you plant it, the better off, the better it's going to be in the long run. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, there were a few policy related questions that came up, Jim, um, in the chat, and um, some were related to you. Uh, Fairfax County specifically, but also um, some other regional implications as well. So this, I think, relates back to the tree action plan, but can you talk a little bit about um, what Fairfax County is doing to work with developers to encourage them to protect trees um, and to convince developers perhaps in changing their minds in terms of the, I'm gonna put a few words <clears throat> in the in the mouth of um, the, the questioner, um, but really to try to protect trees throughout the development process and not just see them as, as a, a, a byproduct of of those developments? Um, the county has actually done a lot of work. Fairfax County, at least in terms of the, the Commonwealth of Virginia is miles ahead, I think, of everybody else. Um, a long time ago, they established certain practices that developers just accepted. And the environmental quality um, corridors and things like that, which are just policies, there's actually no legal force behind them because there's no state supporting legislation. The other thing the county has done, and this is unique to Fairfax County, doesn't even apply to uh, Fairfax City or Falls Church City, is they have adopted um, an ordinance under state code 15.2-961.1, which requires preservation of tree canopy during any development. Uh, no other uh, community has that. Until they had that ordinance, they could negotiate with developers who were asking, you know, as a proffer to uh, protect trees during development. But now they can require it even on by right development. And they work with the development community. The development community is actually involved in writing that legislation. And from what I can see in general, there is um, buy-in from the developers to, uh, to, to follow those uh, directions and even sometimes exceed them. There are, of course, always rogue developers, and unfortunately, with a lot of these small lot developments, the teardown, rebuild, and the infill development, some of them are not quite as well attuned to this, but most of the big developers uh, work in Fairfax County are not only, uh, in my experience, have bought into this, but they're also proponents of tree preservation. But that being said, if you're going to put a big house, you're going to go to a, a, a lot that had a little house on it built back in the 40s or 50s, and you go put a big house on it, you're going to lose trees. It's just, we're you know, we're, we're losing space to grow the trees, and that's really what the whole issue is is creating space for the trees to grow. Great, thank you very much, Jim. 
Um, Couple, a couple of other policy questions. Um, are you aware of any regional groups, either uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments or the Northern Virginia Regional Commission that is developing a way to quantify the carbon sequestration um, based on the various ages and the types of the trees? Um, there were a couple of examples of different um, um, economic uh, programs. iTree, for example, was shared in the chat uh, as an example of this. But really, uh, the, uh, this, this question came from Charlie, and he says that the, having this information could be really beneficial in calculating um, how reforestation could help to meet greenhouse gas reduction uh, goals. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on what's happening at a regional scale that could be applied perhaps more locally as well? Um, I don't know of anything that's particularly happening in that area at a re on the regional scale. Uh, level. There's, of course, a lot of research on trees and carbon. Um, there was just recently a webinar where somebody was talking about um, the benefits of old growth forest and, or old trees and carbon sequestration. Um, and what we're one of the issues we're running into with trees and, and carbon, it, it's pretty simple, really. If you know the density, the volume and density uh, and composition of a particular species, you can measure that volume and figure out how much carbon is in it above ground. The really tricky part about trees and carbon sequestration is what's going on in the root system and the amount of carbon that's being injected into the soils. Trees do a lot of their um, um, taking in oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide in the soil. And in moist soils, you can go through all kinds of uh, uh, chemical processes that eventually wind up with things like calcium carbonate, which is a, a solid that's never going to leave the soil. The trees are also constantly growing and shedding uh, fine root mass. So I don't know of any specific numbers that are happening regionally. I suspect that over the next four years, there's going to be a lot more emphasis and a lot more impetus to actually start doing that. Because at this point in time, carbon dioxide is still not regulated. So there is no regulatory driver to actually do that work. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, I think that that's uh, certainly an area of, uh, I think, as we're trying to really um, justify the the value of these forested areas um, to try and protect them. Um, that's always a, a useful yeah. understanding the economics. The, Laura, the, you mentioned the eye tree thing, and that's one of the bigger issues that we have with the urban forest and trying to estimate the, its carbon value is uh, it's not just about what the trees are doing themselves in terms of putting carbon into their their biomass and into the soil. You also have to think about where the trees are planted because tree, uh, the same tree on the southwest side of a house is going to have a bigger carbon impact than the tree on the northeast side of the house simply because of the shading and the effects on the energy of the energy use on the house. And that's one of the things that comes out if you use either iTree or the National Tree Pen Benefit Calculator. Um, there's one other question, Jim, that has come up that's that's kind of policy related um, in regards to um, what are tree owners legal requirements for removing diseased trees? Um, this may get into a little bit of um, permissions. Legal requirement depends on where it's located. What's that? Oh, uh, you're, nope, you're you're right on track there, Jim. Keep okay. going. So uh, the only point where there is a uh, any kind of a legal impediment to removing trees on your own property is in a resource protection area. Uh, if they are there, then you need to work through. Uh, my my best advice would be to contact the Urban Forest Management Division of Fairfax County. They can walk you through the process of getting that tree evaluated and what you need to do in, in terms of your legal requirements. 
there is a provision in the ordinance for removing dead and diseased vegetation, but it's always, especially in the RPA, and in my experience in dealing with the county regulators, it's better to ask permission than forgiveness because pretty much there is no forgiveness. Right. I, I think uh, we've been working with land development services. They're the ones that enforce a lot of that permitting um, to try to make sure that when folks are trying to do good, that they don't get caught um, with uh, without those appropriate permissions. Um, so they they have uh, beefed up their website a little bit more on um, where you can find those online forms. And it's usually just simply a, a, a quick review process, administrative process on their end. Um, there is a lot of information. I think the, a Google search may um, uh, provide a, a quick link uh, to a number of these different resources that Jim and I are talking about here. Um, one other question, Jim, that came up from Wendy is related to trees around streams. Um, and she is inquiring uh, if you are aware of any programs that are taking care of um, some of the stream side trees that certainly experience erosion and, and things like that, trying to in, enhance the, the soils and protect those trees from further erosion. Are you aware of any specific programs? <clears throat> um. Not specific program uh, for individual or particular trees. I do know the county is rather methodically working with its, its uh, stream system to try and uh, stabilize the streams uh, on stream reaches. And that is, you know, it sounds like she's talking about these trees that are growing right along the banks. Unfortunately, the way stream dynamics works, you can have something fall in the stream, uh, a rock, a big rock or something can get moved and that can have enough of an effect that a, a tree that is doing marginally well can suddenly become completely undercut and fall. Uh, and there is no specific program for dealing with those individual trees. It's more of trying to fix our streams to accept and uh, deal with the uh, the stream flows that they're getting as a result of replacing forest with other land types. Thank you, Jim. Um, the next uh, slew of questions actually relates to the um, Count My Tree app. Um, <clears throat> so some of this is just trying to get some clarification on, uh, on what kind of information to put in there. Um, and a little bit of clarification in terms of um, sort of, I think maybe perhaps the honor system that goes in with with any sort of um, tree reporting uh, from volunteers. But well, uh, Carolyn asked a question: What keeps people from overstating the trees that they plant in the app? Um, at this point in time, as I said, I'm not sure what happens with the data that gets put in there. I know they're capturing it. Uh, presumably, in order to be a uh, counted specifically, you know, especially if it's for something like M an MS4 permit or supporting some other regulation, uh, it does have to be verified by a volunteer. How that's going to happen, I don't know. Um, like I said, we're still kind of working on this, uh, and I have not been trained in what happens to the data after it gets entered. So we're relying right now on people being honorable and recording the number of trees they planted. Great, I appreciate the clarification that you provided as well in your presentation, Jim. Um, is uh, the Department of Forestry, are they counting trees that are also being cut down? No. Okay. That and was a policy decision that somebody way above my pay grade made. We're only okay. counting trees that are being planted. Okay. Um, also, a question just came up. Are you, is this uh, strictly for trees or do you also include any shrubs that you may be planting in, into the system as well? So there is uh, biologically almost no difference between a tree and a shrub. If it's a self-supporting woody stem, it counts. At least that's what I've been told. I wanted to just make an, a note because Jim did give a plug for the seedling sale and I put some information about that in the chat. 
Um, one of the interesting things is the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District cannot necessarily, we cannot put in the information that we sell through the seedling sale because we don't have necessarily verification that all of those seedlings went into the ground. So it is going to be dependent upon each of the, our customers and we'll send out information. So if you're participating in the seedling sale, it will be up to you to count your own trees um, because we will not be uh, incorporating those into the, the Count My Trees app. So um, that is just something we want to encourage all of our, all of the folks that are, all of the good stewards that are putting trees into the ground, our seedlings into the ground. Um, I just wanted to make that clarification as well. Um, Jim, another uh, question related to the app. If you transplant a volunteer tree, should that be counted in the app? Um, it depends on what you mean by transplant. If you're doing something like going out into the woods, which I do not recommend, and digging up little trees and moving them into your yard, then I suppose we could count that because we're not disturbing the canopy in the forest. Um, but if you're talking about, well, this tree volunteered on the left side of my driveway and I want it on my right, no, don't count that. Okay. Um, again, so related- let, to let, me, okay. let me clarify something about that. What we're looking at is expanding the canopy either by tree planting or through natural expansion. One of the things we are gonna be doing is change analysis and looking at, you know, with high resolution photography, how big was the canopy in two, in 2020 or probably 2021 is when we're going to get the uh, the film on that. And then looking at it again in 2026 to see how much it expanded. Okay, so there will be a, a little bit of um, 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 remote sensing or, or um, GIS based analysis as well. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really proud to say that um, across Virginia and even here in Fairfax County, the resolution of a lot of our GIS based geographic information system, which is our mapping systems, um, has gotten quite fine. So with the use of LIDAR and a wide variety of other things, we can we can really pull out some great information. Um, let's see here. I'm going to go through. We will put a link to the Count My Trees app in the um, chat here in just a, a few moments. Um, and oh, somebody already did. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Jim, we're going to just sort of uh, change gears here for and, and capture these questions that came up a little bit earlier. And then um, we will, there's a few more questions that came in that are a little bit more policy related as well, um, which may even be topics for another green breakfast, um, if you will. Um, but Kim asks, what actions can residents take to encourage the adoption of the local tree planting stormwater fund? I don't know, Laura, what can they do? <laughs> I was hoping you'd have a good answer to that. I think if um, you can... No, if it, you it's local, so, so I would say you talk with your supervisors. Exactly. That would be my encouragement as well. Um, I am proud to say that we have been working with a number of county agencies to see about how we can implement that program into um, beginning in FY22. It is a budget-related item. So as that budget process is moving forward, I hope you'll um, encourage um, the board to, to look favorably upon that um, if that is, is something uh, that, that you agree with. So it is a, a modest start, um, but certainly it's a start and, uh, and we're proud of that for sure. So um, yes, I think the more that you can explain uh, to, uh, to our elected officials, uh, the value of the trees, uh, both from from that economic standpoint, but certainly from your emotional uh, standpoint, that's that's also very important as well. Um, Stacy asks Jim, what when is the best time of the year to have an arborist visit? Um, a good competent arborist can come and visit any time of the year. Uh, they should be able to to spot. You know, they should be able to look at, into the the canopy even now and determine which parts are dead and which parts are alive. Um, when you're dealing with uh, suspected cavities or rot in the trunk, that can be done any time of the year. Uh, and there are various ways to do it. One of the things I would point out, um, and I didn't mention this, is 
If you are looking for a certified arborist, go to uh, goodtreecare.com. And if you have a particular uh, concern about the risk of the tree, uh, in addition to certification, there is a uh, tree risk uh, assessment qualification that an arborist can get, and that would be uh, abbreviated TRAQ. So you'd want, want to be looking for an arborist that it, uh, says they have track as well as being certified. Great, thank you very much, Jim. Um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the questions here related to again, kind of what people can do and there was a question about some volunteer opportunities for tree planting projects jim are you um you want to talk perhaps a little bit about um fairfax relief or any other uh, volunteer opportunities that you may be aware of um fairfax relief is probably the if you're really interested in tree planting uh especially if you already have a site um Going to Fairfax Relief, uh, you can contact them uh, at uh, Fairfax Relief, and it's spelled R E L E A F uh, dot com. Don't go to dot org. That's their old site that is horrible. But go to <laughs> dot com, and you can contact them and find out about tree plantings that they're going to be doing that they're looking for volunteers for or if you have a volunteer group and a place to plant, that is the ideal thing, because then all they need to do is show you how to do it and provide the trees. And oddly enough, one of the issues that they are having is finding places to plant trees. So back when Fairfax really first started, they were doing uh, 1,000, 2,000 tree weekends where they were planting one site. Now they're doing you know, they're scrambling to find sites where they can plant 100 trees. That's a big planting for them now, simply because they're running out of large spaces that people will let them plant. There is this fascination with soccer fields, which I think make great places to plant trees and would make a much more interesting game if you had large oak trees in your soccer field, playing the characters <laughs> and all that stuff. <clears throat> Well, Jim, I will tell you as, as as one of those soccer moms that you referenced just a little bit ago, I will uh, definitely share that there's a lot of opportunity and it would be very welcome if we had some large shade trees on the sideline. So um, I do think that there's opportunities there along the soccer fields that wouldn't necessarily impact the game, but certainly would make the, the comfort level of us spectators um, much better. So <laughs> maybe there's some opportunity there. <coughs> Uh, I wanted to let our uh, participants know that I shared the Fairfax Relief um, website with their volunteer <laughs> opportunities. Also, I wanted to put a plug in um, to a great partnership between Fairfax Relief and the Plant Nova Natives um, group um, called uh, uh, Reforest Fairfax. And that's an opportunity to be able to uh, celebrate, memorialize, um, you know, individuals or groups through the purchase of trees that would directly go to support uh, planting of those trees in um, in Fairfax County, again, through the Fairfax Relief Program. It's a great way of, again, keeping, keep uh, being able to do some local good. So um, that information should also be available on the Fairfax Relief website. Another great area to take a look at for volunteer opportunities is the Volunteer Fairfax website. Um, we post a lot of volunteer opportunities on that um, page, and then certainly other groups do the same. So um, that's a, a nice way of being able to, to check and see what's going on. If you yourself are having a, um, a tree planting in your neighborhood, um, in your community, at your community center, and you're looking for um, volunteers, again, this is a great way of being able to get um, some, some information and, and encourage you know, bang the drums a little bit and, and find some folks who can, um, who would be willing to come out and join your event. Uh, Jim, I'm going to um, wrap up here. There have been a number of great announcements shared in the chat. I hope you will take some time again. Um, all of our participants, I hope you'll take a little bit of time to take a look at some of these um, um, uh, events and activities that are coming up. Um, 
There's certainly some information about, uh, again, what citizens can do. Jim, let me ask you this question. How can citizens get involved in the development process um, so that uh, they can inform those that are within their community, perhaps um, new to the community, maybe buying uh, vacant lands within the community to ensure that the value of, of some of those trees and opportunities for tree preservation are shared? What can what can neighbors do to help neighbors? Well, one of the first things I would encourage anybody to do uh, is to go and read the tree action plan, at least the first uh, couple of chapters. Um, this is actually the second version of the tree action plan in Fairfax County. The first one simply asserted the trees were good and went on from there. In this one, we lay out the case for trees. So there is uh, about a four or five page essay um, on the benefits of trees as well as the threats to trees. So it is a good resource for learning about what's going on in the urban forest and why we want the trees and what we have to be um, um, wary of in terms of threats to the trees. And so if you're gonna be an advocate for trees, the first thing you gotta do is arm yourself and this is a good place to start. Um, in terms of following the development process, as soon as some sort of a plan or paperwork is being filed and there is a case number associated, I forget exactly where, but somewhere on the Fairfax County website, probably under land development services or the Department of Planning and Zoning, they will list that. So you can find out very early on when uh, land is going to be developed. In terms of talking to your neighbors, it's again, a question of becoming an informed advocate. And I strongly, strongly urge people to go out there and unfortunately with the internet, you have to be your own filter, but find good scientific uh, based information about the urban forest rather than just something you've always heard or, or folk wisdom. Uh, because there's nothing worse, I think, for an advocate than to be caught saying something that isn't true. We probably have all experienced some something like that um, in recent terms and what that does to credibility. Um, but th those are the things. The other thing you can do as a citizen is most of the supervisors do have um, land development uh, advisory committees within their offices uh, or something to that nature, land use committee or whatever. See if you can get on that or at least go to those meetings because then you'll be able to find out what's going on early. The earlier you engage that process, the more likely you are to have it turned around and get a better outcome. The other thing I do want to stress, and I mentioned this before, is Fairfax County Urban Forest Management Division uh, reviews most of the plans that get submitted. And those people got into that business not because um, they were looking to make a lot of money. They got into it because they love trees. Most They're all certified arborists. They're all tree huggers. And they do everything they can to preserve every tree they can on every development project. So you do have advocates within the county staff who are working to preserve trees in the development process. Thank you, Jim. I also put a couple of links in there for the Fairfax County Tree Commission. I think those of us that live in Fairfax County um, or play in Fairfax County can, can really appreciate the, the good work of our Tree Commission in helping to develop the Tree Action Plan 2019. Um, a link to that plan is also uh, provided in the chat as well. So I, I do wanna just mention, um, if there was a question that came up about, is there a one-stop shop where we can send, um, uh, where, where uh, one-stop website, I should say, uh, for information related to the value of tree trees and um, some of that, the, the preservation, as well as the value that they bring um, to a community. I think it's a great question. Jim, I, I think right now information's a little, little um, in a couple of different places. Fairfax Relief has some, uh, but I think the Tree Commission website uh, has 
quite a bit of information and certainly the tree action plan helps to put it all together. Um, so stay tuned. I think that there may be again through the work of the community of practice, some opportunities for, for continuing to share information and consolidate it into a place that folks can find readily and easily. Um, certainly with all of the questions that came up today, I think that's a great start, even just for an FAQ, um, frequently asked questions kind of uh, kind of page. Um, with that, Jim, I'm gonna I'm going to um, uh, ask Elizabeth's question here and 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 kind of wrap this up here. Um, what can you give us maybe three things that you want the public to know about the tree action plan? in the community of practice? Um, the most important thing I think is that everybody who lives in Fairfax County is part of the community of practice. If you own property, you are a tree manager and we need you to be taking care of your trees and hopefully expanding uh, the canopy. Um, the second thing is that it is a tremendous resource. Yes, for a one stop place, that's a really good one stop kind of crazy of what the value of the urban forest is to the community and what the threats are to the urban forest. Um, and <clears throat> the third thing is there are, um, if I recall correctly, there are some links in there to good tree management. Um, and this isn't really in the tree action plan, but I think the one thing that I always want people to walk away from a seminar about trees understanding is trees and turf do not get along. You get five times more tree root mat mass under mulch than you do under turf. So the best thing you can do for your tree is to pull the grass back as far as you can and put replace it with uh, two to three inches of shredded hardwood mulch, or you can put green mulch in there, which would be any of our native woodland wildflowers. Wonderful. Well, Jim, thank you very much. I want to just acknowledge that Brett has included a, a link to the Tree Basics booklet, which is a great guide um, for those who uh, have have trees on their property and want to uh, want to have a information on how to care for them, even how to plant new trees um, and seedlings. So I um, just really want to, again, thank you all. If you participate in our seedling sale, you will actually receive a copy of the Tree Basics booklet with our ribbon guide uh, in it this year. So it's it's really um, a fantastic resource and, and we look forward to, um, to promoting it as well. Um, with that, I, I certainly see some some additional questions and, and comments coming in um, regarding uh, responses, and uh, certainly hope that those who that do have further conversations or or, or or questions related to the development process, feel free to follow up with me. Um, my email address is I'm going to put it in the chat right now. Um, and uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, what some of those concerns are and also talk about what uh, options there are uh, as well uh, to engage in the development process um, too. So with that, uh, again, I wanted to thank um, Norbert Pink and uh, the, the Great Falls group of the Sierra Club for the beautiful, I'm gonna actually share my screen again so that you can see it. Um, Let's see here. So hopefully you can see uh, my the this this beautiful um, slide from the Sierra Club. Um, they have donated two calendars, two of their beautiful wall calendars um, as door prizes for this uh, this green breakfast. And um, and again, they're just really beautiful to be able to be eligible for the door prize. And I know you're not coming to our green breakfast just for the door prizes, but that's okay. Um, you, uh, there is a link again up at the top of the chat box that you can put your information in. It's just your name and your email address. And if you are selected, we will randomly select um, two, uh, a few names just in case there's a need for a backup. Um, and uh, we will reach out to you and contact you with um, 
with your big win. So um, thank you, Norbert. And Norbert has included a link in the chat as well um, for the Sierra Clubs, Great Falls Groups. They have a weekly uh, Northern Virginia Environment Events email um, that goes out. It's chock full of great information. A number of you that represent different groups and organizations probably see your events on there as well. Um, it's quite a comprehensive list uh, of events. And I hope you took a look at the, um, if you received notification about the Green Breakfast via email, there was a link to a very interesting program that they have coming up on uh, Red Wolf uh, reintroduction. And um, and I just think that that's a really interesting program that, that uh, many of you might be interested in. Um, Plant Nova Natives has also included a number of different activities and events in, in here. And if I hope that you receive um, their notifications of different um, Every month, they usually send out an article of interest uh, that is prime for incorporation into HOA uh, communications, um, but also you can uh, uh, just pass it along to your neighbors one on one if that's the best way of, of engaging uh, your community. But it is really, really insightful, chock full of good ideas, and it's a comp. It, those articles that are developed are, are a compendium from and with input from all sorts of different um, uh, folks, including uh, representatives from the Virginia Native Plant Society, uh, Tree Commission, the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District, the Department of Forestry, and many, many others. So um, I do encourage you to to continue to be engaged if you aren't if you are are already or get engaged with Plant Nova Natives Group because they're doing great things. Um, Jim, I'm gonna give you the last word. And uh, again, I think there's a, um, we just thank you again for the time that you took to prepare for today's uh, information and today's presentation. And um, again, uh, great information. You're a wonderful asset to Fairfax County and, and the Commonwealth as a whole. And um, with that, you get the last word. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. Uh, I would expand on Plant Nova Natives. They do have a Ask the Expert series. Sometime in a couple of weeks, they're going to do shade gardens. And then February 1st, there is going to be an absolutely fabulous presentation on planting trees. If you didn't get enough of me this morning, you can hear me again February 1st. Uh, but it's always a, a pleasure to come and talk to the Green Breakfast. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with people here in Fairfax County. Um, I stopped working 16 years ago when I started working for the Department of Forestry because I just love what I do. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to people this morning. Wonderful. Well, Jim, thank you very much. We hope that everybody will join us again. Oh, I see some claps, yay. Um, uh, we hope to, to see everybody again. Our next Green Breakfast will be March 12th. We will have um, Shannon Curtis, Mr. Shannon Curtis with the um, Fairfax County Department of Public Works and Environmental Services Stormwater Protection Division. Um, he is the branch chief that leads the, the monitoring programs, stream monitoring programs um, in Fairfax County. We're gonna have him come and do an update on um, some of the activities that they're doing and perhaps take a little bit of time to reflect on um, some of the information and what their data is showing after 20 years of collecting it. So um, stay tuned for more information. We'll be promoting that via Facebook as well as through our Green Breakfast uh, email uh, list as well. So thank you all very much. Happy New Year. We will see you in March. Please go out and enjoy this beautiful day and uh, continue to be great stewards. Thank you all.